I recently had someone leave a comment on one of my tutorials stating that they were having lots of issues recording audio and they had to jump through too many steps and it took them 15 minutes or so to record what they wanted to do. So we're going to take 60 seconds just to show you should be able to record your audio in about 60 seconds. And then we'll go into some of the more deeper settings that are important to be aware of. So once we are on the start page of Studio One, we can choose our audio interface here. That's going to be your first step. Click on this drop down menu. Normally I use the focus right, but for this tutorial, I need to use Windows Audio to capture audio from Studio One. We'll click on OK, and then we'll click on the new song dialog. I'm just going to leave this on the default of record and mix. You can then name your song if you'd like. I recommend to my students 48 kilohertz and 24 bit for the sample rate and resolution. We'll click on OK. I'm going to press T as in Tom to bring up the Add Tracks dialog. We're on audio. Then I would like a mono track because typically we're recording with one microphone. So we'll choose mono. We can give it a name if we'd like. I'll leave that on narration. I'll click OK. I'm going to press Shift and E to make this track a little bit larger. Zoom in ver vertically. Now I'm going to arm this for recording, recording. and I'm going to have and a little bit of little feedback, bit of feedback, here, feedback because here because monitoring, monitoring is, on. is on. I'm going to turn that off just for the tutorial. Uh, then I'll just click on record and we can see that my vocals are now being captured into Studio One. So I believe that was just about 60 seconds and this is all it should take for you to capture your audio, whether it's a vocal or an instrument. But now we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive, as I mentioned, into some of the settings that are important to be aware of. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the monitor button. And if you notice, when I engage this, engage this we can hear, we a, can delay. hear a delay. And that's and because that's I'm using, because Windows, I'm using Windows, Windows Audio, and the buffer size or the latency is pretty high with that. But we engage the monitor button when you're using headphones plugged into your audio interface because you don't want it to monitor through your speakers because if you're using recording on a microphone, your speakers can cause feedback into the microphone and you don't want that. So we use our headphones and then we can hear ourselves and any effects that we may apply. So if I were to come to the effects, then to the personas, and then let's scroll down to the reverb, I'll left click hold and drag that onto our track. Let's close out the browser. Now, when I, um, monitor, when I monitor, we can hear this, can hear this reverb. reverb. So, some singers that I've worked with, they like to have a bit of reverb on their vocals when they're recording because it makes them feel a bit more relaxed. And so this is an instance where, again, we turn the monitoring on so that they can hear that reverb on their vocals. Now, how can we get rid of that delay or that latency? So I'm going to press Control and Comma to bring up the Options menu. And then we want to select the Audio Setup tab here. And then we can see the Windows Audio here. If I were to click on this control panel, my latency is taken all the way up. But I can lower this for Windows, and that's going to eliminate some of that latency. Now, if you're using a regular audio interface plugged in with USB or Thunderbolt, you're going to see something a little bit different here, and it's going to look a little something like this. And this is what it looks like when I bring when I'm using my focus right, and we'll want to take the block size or the latency down somewhere between 250 or 120 and below, and that's going to get rid of any latency that you're hearing in your headphones while you're monitoring your signal. Now back on the window settings again, if I were to take this slider down even lower, then that should reduce some of the latency, although it probably won't get rid of all of it. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is that when you're reducing the latency for your recordings, it is going to stress your processor a little bit more, put more pressure on the computer because you're saying, hey, crunch these numbers and, and make this happen a little bit quicker so that you can hear your vocals immediately. You can always check out your CPU activity down here in the transport area. That little blue speck there is how much of our processor is being used. Let's go ahead and close out this options menu. And if I click on the word performance, then we can see more detailed information on the CPU usage. If I click on show devices, then we can see any devices and what uh, CPU usage they are causing. So that room reverb that I brought in is causing some CPU use. If I were to open up the inspector by clicking on the eye and power off the room reverb, then we can see our CPU usage has dropped significantly. 
Okay, let's go ahead and close that window out. And we'll also close out our inspector. Now, a couple other things to be aware of is that we can choose our input source from our audio interface by coming to the track column here for this narration track. We see we have input one. I'll left click once on that. And then we can see I have two in two inputs available. This is just the left and right microphone that are built into my laptop screen. But if you have an interface that has say eight inputs, you should see those available here and you can choose whatever one you would like for this track. Now, if we come down to the very bottom, we have audio IO setup. And if I click on that, then we're taken to the audio IO setup. And then we can see our routing matrix here. So this is going to show at the very top here, all of the physical inputs that are available on our audio interface. On the left hand side, we can see how they're going to show up and their names within Studio One. So we can see input one is here and we have input one there. By default, these are going to say probably left and right, but you can double click on these and name them however you'd like for them to be. Now here we can see we have LR, M, this is just mono, and then this is for stereo. So if I wanted to use both microphones on my laptop in stereo, then I would, this is what that would be. These are both linked because we have these boxes here. If I were to click to deselect those, then let's click on apply. And we can see that that signal goes away because these are no longer bridged together. I'll go ahead and click to put those back in and apply. And now we can see our stereo signal is available once again. And this applies to our mono inputs as well. This is, these are using one and two here as well. It's just that we're using one at a time to capture mono. So if I were to deselect this here and apply, notice we have level here on our track in the track column. We also have level here, but as soon as I apply, because I've unbridged this connection from the physical input of the audio on my laptop or your audio interface with the logical uh, input in Studio One, we no longer have that signal here or here on our track. Again, I'll click once to add that, click on apply, and we can see that our signal is now active again. Now, if you do have an audio interface with more than two inputs, but you only have connections for the first two, then you can click on add mono, and then this will populate new fields, and they should spread out a bit further depending on how many inputs you have on your audio interface. And just be sure that you click to put an M for mono tracks. And if you wanted to add stereo, click on stereo, and then you'll want to click, and then both of these will be populated like so. Anytime, these will just kind of go down diagonally here, and you'll want to be sure that the boxes are clicked in there to be sure that these are linked together. Okay, anytime you'd like to remove, just click once to select it, and then we have remove. I'll click once here and hold shift to select that one, click on remove to take those out, and then we'll click on OK and exit out of our I.O. setup. Now another important thing to keep in mind is your gain setting on your physical audio interface. And if you notice here, this level is pretty low. We can see that we could barely see this waveform. Now, while I'm hovering on this audio event, we see we have these little handles that pop up. Okay, so I can grab the center one and take the gain for that audio up even further, all the way up to, I believe, 24 dB. Yep, so 24 dB. So if you do have a low signal, you can use this handle to take up the gain. And I think this is a good looking signal to capture, but before you even begin recording in Studio One, it's very important. More important than your settings in Studio One is to be sure that you're not clipping on your audio interface. So you should have some sort of indicator, whether it's a single LED that will turn red when it's clipping, or you may have a little halo ring on the focus right. You can see here that this is clipping, and generally I recommend to people to play or sing the loudest passage of the song, and then take it up to where it's clipping and then back it down from that clipping. Because if you get that clipping, you're gonna have a distorted, crunchy sound in your audio and you're not gonna be able to get rid of that. So before any of the settings in Studio One, be sure that you're setting your gain properly on your physical audio interface.
Now, taking a look at this audio, uh, this audio event, we can see that we have one single waveform, and that's because we're recording in mono. Now, I'm going to press T as in Tom again, and this time I'm going to, for the format, change that from mono to stereo. And then we can see that this automatically switches to that stereo 1 and 2 that we saw in our input-output matrix. Uh, and you can also click on here to choose the inputs from your audio interface at any time before you add the track. So I'm going to click on OK. And I'm going to press comma to come back to the beginning of the song. Let's actually take this out of record arm. And it's important when you are recording that you take the record arm off the record arm off on any tracks you don't want to record to and activate it on the tracks on the that tracks. you do. So we do want to record this one and we can see we have two level meters here now versus the one that was initially here. We can see that single, now we have double down there. But let's take that record arm off. I'll go ahead and activate record. record. And we can see let's mute that this top my track. Vocal. And now we can see that the signal is coming in. We have two waveforms here. Let's go ahead and stop that with pressing the space bar. Again, we'll click on this handle, and I'll take this gain up. So when we're recording in stereo, we're going to have two waveforms representing the left and right input. Now, for most of us, we're only going to record stereo from, say, a hardware synthesizer that has two outputs, left and right. And those signals can have different a bit of different variance within them. And if we take a look at the track column for this narration stereo track, we can see we have two circles there representing our left and right inputs. Here on our mono, we only have one circle. So these, this is just a little identifier as well. We can also see that it specifically says stereo, and this one specifically says mono. Now we could also click on this, and that's going to change this track to a mono track. And if I were to click once to select this audio event and then control B, it's gonna bounce it to a mono audio file because of the change that we made here. Now we can change the behavior of these tracks and how they behave when we select them for these audio tracks. So you can see when I select this one, it, it doesn't arm for recording. Uh, when I deselect here, we can see these are not turning on and automatically prepared for recording. And that's because I specifically uh, changed the setting for Studio One. But if we come to the wrench icon here, we can see in this first section here that we have audio input follows selection. So if I select that, let's come back. Now, when I select this track, it's automatically armed. It's muted, but it's, it's automatically muted, armed for it's recording. Automatically armed if, for I record. this one, if I select this one, if I select this one, it's also it's automatically also armed for automatically recording, armed and for recording and monitoring. And monitoring. So, if we come back to the wrench icon, we do have a setting down here at the bottom for monitoring follows record, and that is selected. So, if I uncheck that box, and then now when I select this track, we can see that it does automatically arm for recording, but the monitoring is not engaged when we deselect that box. Okay, so again, coming to the wrench icon, I'll recheck the monitoring follows record. Now when I select this, we can see our yes. monitoring. We can see our monitoring. Now following along with that automatic, along with that arm, automatic for recording. arm for recording. Now some final things to be aware of is that I like to tell people that don't think of these don't as think the, of these as uh, let me actually turn off that automatic don't think of these as the actual audio files, but rather representations of your audio files. So if we were to come to the edge, we can trim this and pull these sides in, and then we're not going to hear uh, anything. And now we can see Until we get that to this little window that we see showing the waveform. And that's what I like to think of it as, as a window. And these are the shades. So if we pull the shades in, well, we can't see anything outside of our window that our shades have been pulled in. Uh, but th that doesn't mean the outside has disappeared. It's just that we're pulling the shades in. We can only see a little bit of outside or hear a little bit of our audio. And this does not affect the original audio file. This is, these are non-destructive actions. If I were to come to the top left corner and introduce a fade in, or the top right corner and introduce a fade out, our original file is unaffected. 
So let's come to the bottom right corner and click on the browse and we'll click on the pool tab here. Now we can see these are the original audio files. Okay, so here, if I select the narration, this audio event and delete that out, we can see it's still here. It hasn't gone anywhere. So if you find that you are working on a track and you accidentally have deleted some audio events and you're worried that you've lost it, just come to the pool and then I can left click hold and drag that audio event back in. Now the final, final thing we'll talk about is time stretching with your audio. Because if you record audio events or if you record an instrument or vocal, let's control comma to bring up the, actually I don't want control comma, let's do control in and bring up the ad tracks or the new song dialogue. If we scroll down here, we can see that stretch audio files to tempo is selected by default. Okay, we'll cancel out of here. Let's close out our browser. So just know that if I play this back, and now we can see that. Okay, the that sounds normal. In. But if I were to come to the tempo down at the bottom and let's say change that to 70 BPM, I'll press enter and then play our audio back again. And now we can see that. The signal is coming okay, in. Okay, so it's going to slow it down because of that initial setting in the uh, new song dialog here at the bottom for stretch audio files to tempo. If you'd prefer not to have that behavior, you can deselect here. And Studio One's going to remember that every time you create a new song, it won't change it unless you change it back. But we can also turn that function off for individual tracks. So if I click on the I to come back to our inspector, we can see that the tempo is set to time stretch. And that's what that checkbox does. It makes these tracks function in a time stretch mode. And um, actually this is set, the mode is set to drums. And really, if you do wanna keep this on, you'd wanna use say solo for instruments or vocals that are playing a melody. Now, if you have polyphonic material like a piano or instruments that are playing chords, then you'll probably wanna try the sound, the Elastique Pro format. If it's drums, then you can use the drum setting. And we also have a tape resampler mode, which is kind of interesting. So if I switch that to the tape, now let's listen to how this sounds when we play this back. So that's gonna function more like a traditional sampler and slow the vocal down and it's gonna be pitched down as well. It's kind of like if you are old enough to remember cassette tapes. If you play those back slower, then it's gonna have this similar behavior. Now, if I were to take the tempo while we're in this tape mode up to say 160, let's press enter. Now play this back. Let's mute this top track. Let's and take it up even faster. I'm gonna left click The signal hold. is coming in. We have two We'll bars. come back. Okay, so now we have that chip mode waveforms. effect. So that's what's gonna happen when you set the time stretch mode to tape, okay? But I'm gonna put this back to the default of drums. And I think we're gonna wrap up here. So I hope that you have found some useful information in here if you are struggling with recording audio and trying to understand all of the different settings that are available. Also, be aware that I do provide one-on-one -on -one training with me over Zoom for Studio One. So if you're interested in that, check out the pinned comment below or the description area of this video. Otherwise, I hope to see you in the next tutorial and thanks for watching.